um, so I'm very happy to, to be here. It's my first time ever in South America. So uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to be in this uh, wonderful place and wonderful uh, landscapes. And also to do the, this webinar. Um, so uh, I will uh, take more than one hour. Uh, first, let me uh, warn you already for the first lecture because uh, one hour is not enough. Um, so I will see after some uh, like this morning, uh, we make a, a short break and then come back. Or if we make a long lecture of one hour and a half, it will depend where I am uh, when it's uh, 10, to 10 to 3. And uh, so you will see. Because the first lecture is setting uh, the basis. Uh, the second lecture will be on Wednesday, and it will be more on the atomic physics uh, part where I will describe adiabatic potentials that we use to make this kind of bubble. I will describe in the third lecture where I will present an overview of uh, our work, experimental work on the collective modes uh, at the bottom of this bubble. So essentially it's a two-dimension two -dimensional gas in a harmonic trap for most of it. But uh, if we now excite uh, high rate rotations, for example, the, the fact that it lives inside the bubble now becomes very important. And uh, if I time allows, I will show you results uh, where the, the fact that there is a bubble shape is really uh, relevant. Okay, so this first uh, lecture, uh, lecture one, will be a, the opportunity for me to make reminders uh, on both Einstein condensation, superfluid hydrodynamics, and collective modes of, of a trapped superfluid. And it's um, naturally connected to the other lectures, in fact, where uh, we've seen uh, just before uh, Lange the Grospitevsky equation, or if you prefer nonlinear Schrodinger equation, okay, that's the same. <laughs> and uh, also we've uh, seen uh, turbulence uh, this morning with vortices, and I will mention that. And tomorrow there will be the lecture of uh, David, which uh, will also be related to some of the things I mentioned here, uh, seen with a different point of view. Okay. So why a quantum gases? Well, the uh, idea that uh, quantum gases benefit from a very high degree of control experimentally uh, of their external and internal degrees of freedom, which makes them a very nice system for uh, studying as a, as a model system, uh, in my case, superfluidity, but also other questions. Uh, in this system, you can control the temperature very nicely to very, very high temperatures with um, essentially evaporative cooling that I will not discuss here, but which is a technique where you essentially remove hotter particles to uh, uh, equilibrate at a lower temperature. You can control in some cases the interaction strength between atoms. And this is done by tuning a magnetic field and modifying molecular resonances uh, between two colliding atoms. And so the parameter which controls the interaction, so it's the scattering length A. A um, will set typically the interaction energy, and in my presentation, the parameter that was called epsilon by Sergei is called G in my talk, but that's the same thing that's uh, which uh, defines the nonlinearity. And uh, you can also manipulate very nicely the confinement geometry, so here are examples. Uh, this is a ring trap that we have built in, in my group. I will mention the bubble in the second lecture. Uh, you can use periodic potentials and uh, mimic a, a lattice um, and study the transport of collisions in the lattice like the transport of electrons in ion lattices. And uh, with a, an adequate compression of one of or two transverse dimensions make the gas one-dimensional or two-dimensional. So in one dimension, uh, as was already pointed out, uh, then the system becomes integrable, and there are lots of work on integrable boson, uh, bosonic systems uh, with cold gases. And uh, in two dimensions, I will mention uh, in the last 
lecture uh, specific uh, properties of two-dimensional uh, both gases um, at low temperature. And uh, there are several internal states. Uh, you can make spin-offs of condensate with different colors, if you like, and decide if you will use bosons or fermions. Well, the, uh, the physics will be very different. And um, most of all, it's easy to detect the atoms. And recently, there have been tremendous progress in detecting atoms individually. And in this picture, uh, the, the it's, uh, it's done in the group of uh, Marcus Greiner. Uh, the atoms can be seen one by one in an optical lattice. So this is an example of uh, a mod phase where because of a novel harmonic trapping of the gas, the density is bigger in the center and less at the edges. And so the filling factor of the mod phase is different in the center and in the edges. And what you see is the parity of the atom number. So here there, there are uh, there is one atom per site, two, three, and four in the center. And that's what is observed is it is the parity of the atom number. Okay, so as you can see, uh, cool atoms uh, provide lots of control and for this reason they, they can be used, this is a spirit of quantum simulation, uh, as a model system and uh, analog system with other physical systems. And in my uh, lecture series, I will insist on the superfluid dynamics of these gases because this is a main topic of, uh, of the school also. I give you few references, but uh, more uh, of course are, are relevant, and especially uh, the last uh, book of Lev Spitevsky and Sandro Stringari, which is dedicated to condensation, potential condensation and superfluidity. So it is highly relevant to what I will describe uh, today. And this is a review paper that is already a very nice introduction to, to the topic. Okay, so I will uh, start by describing uh, Bose-Einstein condensation in non-interacting gases, uh, gases to start with. So just uh, thermodynamic uh, consideration and the transition to BEC uh, by saturation of the excited state. Then I will introduce interactions, weak interactions, I will say, uh, for small parameters of the interaction. And finally, describe when we introduce a time dependence, what is the dynamics in these gases. So very quickly, uh, and fermions obey either the fermi dirac distribution or the Bose-Einstein distribution. And uh, because of this little sign difference in the denominator here, uh, either the occupation uh, number of each state is bounded by one, so either you have one fermion or zero fermion per state, and on average it's uh, below one, or uh, you can have the situation with this quantity diverges if the energy uh, and mu are equal, so if you go to the ground state, uh, the uh, occupation factor in particular is not bounded, so you can accumulate lots of particles in particular in the ground state. But because of this shape of the distribution, it completely changes the physics at low temperature. So at low temperature, fermions essentially occupy the N first levels, if they are N fermions, up to what is called the Fermi energy, given by the energy of the uh, highest energetic uh, particle. Uh, so there is no uh, phase transition there. It's uh, just you fill uh, up, and this is called the Fermi C. Uh, there, there, there is a phase transition. Uh, there is also superfluidity possible, like in helium-3, but this implies bonding between a uh, pair of, of two particles. Um, for bosons, uh, then, uh, as I already said, there may be a, a very large occupation uh, number in some particular state. So if you look at the occupation number, you can already notice that the chemical potential, which is uh, obtained by saying that if you I sum um, all the, this number of all states, I must get the number of particles. Uh, the chemical potential has to be below any of these energy levels, otherwise this would not be uh, positive. 
Uh, so in particular, it has to be below the ground state. So let me make an estimate for the sum of the particle numbers I can put in all the excited states, so I sum over all the states except ground state. And to estimate that, I can use the fact that mu is less than E0. And if I do this, then I get a sum where mu is not there anymore and which I can uh, compute and depends on me and on temperature. And now th this sum, depending on the way the states are uh, uh, dense or not uh, in the energy space, depending on the way they are arranged, may or not converge. So if this sum is infinite, okay, n prime is less than infinity, it's not very interesting. Uh, you can put as many uh, particles in the excited state as you want. But if it's finite, then the number of particles that can occupy the excited state is bounded. So if you put more particles than this maximum number, all the supplementary particles have to go into the ground state of the system. Uh, and then the occupation of the ground state becomes macroscopic for n exceeding this uh, maximum number of particles in the excited state. So this is called the saturation of the excited state, and this um, is uh, the phase transition to Bose-Einstein condensation. So you can either see it as n being larger than a critical number of particles given the temperature, or uh, as the temperature being below a critical temperature defined by the critical number at this critical temperature is the atom number. So if you have a, a temperature below, then you, you have to, to have particles in the ground state. So in this case, if I reuse this little drawing, it's more like all the particles will accumulate into the ground state. And I must uh, stress that this occurs for a temperature which is much larger than the typical spacing between levels. It, it's not a trivial effect, Maxwell distribution, okay, if I have a temperature much, much less than this splitting, they have to accumulate, of course, in the ground state. No, this uh, transition typically occurs uh, while the uh, okay, no, uh, while well the temperature is much, much larger than the splitting between uh, states. It's really a quantum statistics that gives this uh, condensation. Okay, so now uh, we wonder, I said this works if uh, the total number of the excited state n max is bounded, if there is this, this sum converges. But if it does not converge, then there is no BEC. So we could wonder if this sum converges or not, and a way to evaluate it is to make a semi-classical approximation where you describe the discrete states by some density of states. And then there is a nice uh, general rule that if your density of states is a power law, then you can uh, evaluate this critical atom number and uh, you find that it's uh, directly proportional to the temperature to the power k, where k is the power of the power law, times the sum of 1 over n to the power k plus 1, sum over n. This sum converges only if k is strictly positive. So you will have a BC uh, phenomenon if you have a density of state which uh, is a power law with a strictly positive power. Uh, and then the fraction of condensed particle by making a uh, easy rule by saying that the total atom number is n prime plus n zero, you find that the condensed fraction is one minus t over tc to the power k plus one. Okay, so in a harmonic trap, let's consider this case first, which was the case uh, which has been demonstrated in 95, and uh, that's why Cornell and Wyman and Sotali were awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, in a harmonic trap in dimension D, then the e density of state is a power law, with the power being D minus 1. Uh, so it means that as soon as D is strictly larger than 1, so D is 2 of 3, uh, then the sum converges and uh, BC is possible. So that's uh, our host, Randall uh, who showed that uh, typically in 2D there is a Bose-Einstein condensation in a harmonic trap because I will show you later that uh, four particles in the box is another story. So for a 3D harmonic trap, this is the first uh, BEC uh, in 95. 
uh, you have a critical temperature which scales that like the particle number to the power one third. And as I mentioned already, if you take, say, 10 to the 6 atoms, then n to the power one third is 100. And you see that the critical temperature is 100, the separation between states. So it's not a um, Boltzmann distribution effect. It's really a quantum transition. And so the fraction of condensed atoms nicely scales with 1 minus t over tc to the power 3, as has been uh, studied right after the first condensation. This is also the Cornell and Weinmann group. Now in a box, so this is the first calculation that has been made uh, by Einstein, it was in a box. Um, then in a box, the density of state is with the power d over 2 minus 1, where d is the dimension. So for, for it to be uh, strictly positive, d must be strictly larger than 2. Uh, so you see that d equals 2 is marginal. It's marginally not condensing, so it is really a specific dimension. So only for three dimensions, really, there is the Bose-Einstein condensation phenomenon. So 3D uh, box BEC has been recently only um, observed with, with uh, cold atoms because it's not so easy to prepare a box trap. And this has been allowed by uh, the development of uh, light tailored by SLM devices. And so they, uh, this is a, an example of density distribution inside the box. And this is done in the group of uh, Zoran Adjebavich in Cambridge. And here you see the appearance of the BC fraction in the time of light distribution that is in the momentum distribution of the gas. And what is very, very nice in his setup uh, is that this is done with um, potassium atoms. And this is an example where you can really nicely tune the interactions between particles. There is a resonance, flash bar resonance, very convenient. And thanks to this flash bar resonance, they are able to also put the interactions to zero and really observe the textbook Bose-Einstein condensation. So in a box without interactions, everything under control. And you see very nicely in this case the saturation of the excited state. Uh, so here is a number of particles in the ground state and the number of particles in the excited states as a function of the total atom number at a given temperature. And you see the saturation of the thermal atoms when you exceed the critical number of particles at a given temperature. This is a very nice illustration of uh, the phenomenon of saturation of the excited state. Uh, you use uh, the evaporation to control the temperature. So the, the thermal bath is more than you, you do all the experiment at, uh, with a controlled temperature by using an RF knife or a, here it's, it's probably not, I don't remember if it's a knife or if it is uh, the just the depth of the box but you set the temperature like that, and you repeat the experiments with various atom numbers. So it's, uh, it's set by uh, the gas itself and collisions, given the depth. OK, so um, I forgot to point out that uh, in a box, the critical number of atom scales like t to the power of 3 half, so directly linked to this power law here. And this you can also recast using the thermal de Broglie wavelength, which is a typical size of a wave packet, uh, of the, the atomic wave packet, and scales like 1 over square root of the temperature. So this is a case uh, that uh, Sergei was describing uh, this morning, where you describe uh, the particles essentially with the uh, uh, waves. So here it's more in terms of wave packets than in terms of uh, plane waves. So the size the of the wave packet, as it scales like 1 over square root of T, increases when you lower t the temperature. And Tc corresponds, in fact, to the region where the size of the wave packet becomes equal to the interparticle mean uh, distance. So that now they the atoms they cannot ignore each other 
uh, and they have to decide if there are bosons and fermions, and if there are bosons, they will pose condense and have the single wave function for all the atoms. Okay, so all that is very nice, but that was for non-interacting particles. And now we can wonder uh, if this um, simplified picture of all atoms being in the same wave function is still true once we have uh, interactions with particles, because interactions uh, will be responsible for a new term in the Hamiltonian, and instead of having the total Hamiltonian and particles being the sum of individual Hamiltonian of each particle and always the same Hamiltonian, for which now the ground state is really nice, it's just the product of all particles being in the same ground state of the single particle Hamiltonian. Here we have this term here. And this term introduces correlations between different particles. So now if the interactions are strong, we cannot ignore the correlations between particles when we look for the total ground state of this n particle Hamiltonian, n body, many body Hamiltonian. And so what we have said before with this single wave function will not be true anymore. And this is typically the case when you go to mode insulator phases where the correlations are very important and we cannot treat the all the atoms are being in a single wave function. However, uh, maybe if the interactions are small enough, we can still keep this picture of being the single wave functions for all the particles and consider the interactions as a perturbation of that. And so to s decide if this is relevant or not, a nice experiment to perform is to check if uh, the condensate is coherent. So if indeed I can consider that there I have just one wave function, and in this case, if it produces interferences, if I make an overlap between two bases. And that's the exper experiment performed in the group of Ketterle at MIT in 96, where they prepared two bases and let them expand in the expansion that would interfere and produce fringes of density. Uh, very nice. And another experiment uh, done uh, slightly afterwards in Munich also uh, let two BC fall with a different, a little difference of time. And then you see the beat note between these two BCs. And the contrast, the contrast here is excellent. And so what they did is to extract some different part of the BC. And if you stay inside the BC, essentially, the contrast is almost 100%. So the coherence length of a BC is essentially the size of the BC for a usual experiment. So the, m the fact that we have this curve uh, tells you that the interactions are weak enough and that a mean field description can be appropriate to describe uh, the gap. And that's the spirit of uh, the description uh, that follows. So how we will we find the ground state of the n-particle Hamiltonian with this um, assumption of weak interactions? We will uh, use a mean field description and assume that all the particles have the same wave function, such that the total wave function is uh, just a product of n times the same single particle wave function, and we want to, to know what is this wave function. And then it, it's a way of saying that for the interactions, one atom is just inside the mean field of the interactions with all the n minus particles. So with this approach, uh, you uh, psi, psi of r is a kind of test wave function for which you want to minimize uh, the total Hamiltonian and find the wave function that would minimize the total energy. So if you do so, you come uh, to the famous Kospitaevsky equation. Uh, so this one is with dimensions, but not the same as this morning, I think. Uh, there are the m's and h bars back uh, at their place, and even the factor of two. <laughs> and uh, so essentially, you, you come to uh, with mu being the chemical potential, being the Lagrange uh, multiplicator that you use to say that the wave function has to be normalized. 
and uh, you get essentially a Schrodinger equation with kinetic energy, some potential energy, if any, mu, which plays the role at the energy in the Schrodinger equation, plus the interacting term, which is a nonlinear term of this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So as I said, my little g is the epsilon of this morning, but it is with dimensions in this case. And it is directly proportional to the scattering length and I mentioned earlier, uh, which describes the interactions at uh, low energy. So for all the rest of this course, I will take positive interactions. So I will only consider uh, repressive interactions and not attractive interactions. So one of the reasons is w because attractive interactions BC, at least in 3D, are unstable as soon as there are more than uh, maybe 100 particles typically. Uh, but if we want to st study solitons in 1D, uh, then we should have this G negative, just to warn you, bright solitons, we would need a negative G. Okay, and uh, mu is a chemical potential which represents the cost to add a particle to the system, yes. Yes, but here, here, uh, here, it will very, very well describe uh, the Bose gases to an extent uh, wi with quantitative uh, much better results than in helium because in helium the condensate fraction is uh, below 10 percent, and so the interactions uh, are extremely strong and they are responsible for a quantum depletion of the condensate of uh, uh, extremely large. So even at zero temperature you expect a depletion uh, uh, which is 90% uh, essentially. So here, what, I, what is small, uh, the small parameter of the theory is uh, the density times the cube of the scattering length in 3D. So the small parameter, this is a small parameter. And so this will also give you typically the quantum depletion and uh, it's 10 minus 2, 10 minus 3. Uh, so the quantum depletion is very small and in helium it would be much larger. Yes, yeah. so maybe I'm not specialist of, so what I say that with the even the very simple Gospilevsky that was not derived for uh, cold atoms, but f most for, uh, for helium, uh, it works in an incredible way. It works very, very well with cold atoms in a quantitative way, whereas uh, for helium you have to correct, you have to introduce uh, additional ingredients. So here I it's really working very nicely. You, you have to fight to find uh, beyond Milfield effect, in fact, in quantum gases. So people are really proud when they say, you look, I found some beyond quantum Milfield effect. So otherwise, uh, essentially, you have Milfield. Okay, this is easy. No, this is very easy. Okay, I, uh, I can almost do it uh, here. But uh, you do that with a Gaussian ansatz, typically. So you write your equation. You have, uh, let me take a Gaussian ansatz, so I have a trap. And I wonder uh, what is the size of uh, my cloud in the trap, which I, I call sigma, a Gaussian of width sigma. I wonder what is the sigma. And uh, I say, okay, my sigma will be the one which minimizes the energy. Okay, so what is the kinetic energy? Well, it's h bar squared over 2m sigma squared. Uh, what is the potential energy? It's one half. So uh, I will uh, 
mm, introduce the atomic number uh, only in, in G prime. It's one half of m omega squared sigma squared. What is the interaction energy? So now it's G times the density. So it's uh, G times the atom number. And the density is more or less, well, the density is N times uh, sigma squared, OK? And so this uh, cube, sorry. OK. And now you make a nice drawing. So first. Let's remark that if G is positive, uh, there is no problem, because I always have a minimum for this equation. Those two diverge at short sigma. This one diverges at long sigma, so uh, there is a minimum in between. I'm happy. But what if G now is negative? Then you have a competition between the uh, sigma squared and the sigma cube, because now at short distances, this will always win. So at very short distance, you have an attractive potential that tends to get a collapse of your big. And now it depends. You have to differentiate and find the, uh, the inflection point and the minima, etc. So either you're lucky, and because of the sigma squared here, you get something like that. And the sigma squared always wins at large distances. And there you have a, an equilibrium point for your BC, and it is stable. But if you have too many atoms, so then these terms is growing, growing, up to a point where it's flat here, and up to a point where it's like that, and there is no solution except zero, so the BC collapses. And you find a criterion on the atom uh, number, uh, which is essentially uh, that uh, Na has to be uh, smaller than the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Something like that. And so uh, it's not a lot. OK. Uh, so let me now look at the solution of this gross equation for uh, two typical cases. So a BC in a box and a BC uh, in a trap. So I do not take a periodic boundary conditions. I uh, take a hard wall boundary conditions. So if there are no interactions, uh, as I removed the potential and I also removed interaction, I just have the Schrodinger equation uh, for free particles, uh, okay, this is easy, and because of boundary conditions, I get a sine wave in my box with um, a maximum here. So here I plot, uh, it's not just the sine, because I plot the square of the wave function, so I plot the density. Now if I increase the interactions, the, the effect of the repressive interaction will be to flatten the bottom, and the condensate will try to go to the edges, but there is the zero imposed by the hard wall, so they cannot strictly go to the side, but they will have to manage between uh, the maximum density at the center and the side. And um, uh, so with a uniform density, the density will be larger in the center because of the, the condition. And the size typically over which uh, the density goes down is called the healing length. And to estimate it, you can say that OK, here, uh, the reason why it's flat, it's because of interaction energy. So here, uh, you have no kinetic energy. When it is flat, the second derivative is 0. So all the energy is uh, interaction. And here, uh, as it goes to 0, interaction energy drops, and the kinetic energy is dominant. So the size of psi will be essentially given by um, the kinetic energy associated to bending the wave function is given by uh, the chemical potential mu, so by the interaction. And this gives you the size of psi as being h bar over square root of 2 m mu. So this formula uh, is, uh, tells you that uh, the this healing length, which is called healing because it's the length over which 
you have to cope with uh, some constraint uh, is proportional to one over the square root of the interaction, one over the square root of the economical potential. So the larger interaction and the smaller disk size. So if I increase even more the interaction, I tend towards the situation where the density is just n over l uniform in the box, except at the very edge where it drops very sharply because of large interaction. So close to the edge, in fact, there is a, an analytical solution. Uh, it's exact for a half wall, and uh, it's given by a hyperbolic tangent, which, as you see here, it fits. Th so this one is a numerical solution of the Ospitevsky equation, and this uh, dashed red is the analytic uh, hyperbolic tangent, so it matches completely. Whereas in this case, you see that there was still a, a little difference between the exact uh, numerical uh, solution and the hyperbolic tangent. Okay, so now in a harmonic trap, uh, if I have no interactions, uh, you know the result. Uh, the result is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, so with a size which is given by what uh, is written exactly here, square root of h bar over m omega, so Gaussian of with this width. Um, and if uh, I increase the interactions, but still moderate here, you see that uh, the density is still Gaussian, but a broadened Gaussian. And you can find a correction to the sigma of the Gaussian, taking into account the interactions. And if you increase the interactions much uh, more, then it's uh, really non-Gaussian anymore, so this is a blue line. And you see that it comes closer to this curve that I will comment now. And so this uh, dashed magenta curve is just an inverted parabola. And the inverted parabola is a solution you find if you completely neglect the kinetic en uh, energy. The kine up. So you completely neglect the kinetic term uh, as compared with interactions and potential. So you just have potential and interactions left being equal to mu psi, and in this case, you can just remove one of the psi and see that uh, the solution is, is uh, directly given uh, in terms of the density being uh, proportional to minus the external potential. So if you have a parabolic external potential, you will have an inverted parabolic density uh, for the atoms. So this, uh, in this limit of large interactions, it fits really nicely, except at the very edges here, because of course here the density is less, so the interaction is much less, and then the kinetic term becomes important again. And this size, you can guess its size, is again the healing length. So the length over which you can recover from the solution. Because you cannot have a, a density falling just like that, you need some healing length to fix that. So the radius of this distribution, which is called the Thomas Fermi uh, distribution initially developed for, for fermions um, is uh, just given by saying that at the age of the gas the density is zero so this gives you a radius such that the potential at this radius equals the chemical potential so for a harmonic trap uh, it's one over uh, the harmonic frequency times square root of two mu over n so the stronger the interactions, the stronger this Thomas Fermi, the larger this Thomas Fermi radius, and the tighter the trap, the smaller this uh, Thomas Fermi radius. And as you you can notice directly that the scaling of the Thomas Fermi radius is not uh, like the oscillator. So it scales like one over the whereas the ground state, the Gaussian ground state, is one over square root of the frequency. So it does not scale the same way, and if you have an uh, asymmetric harmonic potential in three dimensions, so the ratio between the ready in two directions is different than in the non-interacting case. You will have ratio which are directly given by the ratio of the uh, oscillating frequ oscillation frequencies and not a uh, square root of the ratio of the oscillating frequencies. Okay, so now I go to the uh, last part of this uh, lecture, unless you want to make a, a break because this could be
point to make a break uh, because now I will, uh, I don't know, I, I, I still need uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes. So either we continue or we make a 10 minute break. Uh, what do you prefer? So if you're not completely dead, <laughs> so let me continue. So it will be uh, just a long lecture and uh, not too shorter. Okay, so now uh, this is exactly uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that has been uh, described this morning with units uh, in the sense that I uh, remove the mu psi and uh, introduce time dependent equation. And um, so this describes, it, it can be derived in the same way as uh, the uh, static uh, Positivsky equation uh, was derived and it will be described in more detail tomorrow by David. And uh, with this equation now we can describe uh, the dynamics of a BET when it is cut out of equilibrium, the equilibrium solution being the one I have just described before, uh, the ground state of the Hamiltonian. All right, and in fact this um, formulation of the time-dependent Gross-Pitevsky equation can be recapped into uh, two hydrodynamic equations. If I write the wave function as the square root of a density times uh, the phase, and uh, by identifying, so this is, this is a complex number. So in fact, it contains two numbers, right? And these are two real uh, numbers. So it's normal that from my single equation on a complex wave function, I get two equations on two variables for a real variables. And so the, the, the two equations come from uh, adi uh, equating the real part and equating the imaginary part. So this equation describes uh, the conservation of uh, mass or particles. So it's a continuity equation and this one is a Euler equation which describes the dynamics uh, along the field. And in this equation, uh, you can notice that I don't have the phase anymore, but I have V instead, where V is a gradient of the phase. So it's a fluid velocity. And uh, written like that, it's clear that it's a uh, rotational is zero unless we are at a point where the density vanishes. And uh, it is interesting that what is important now is a gradient of the phase uh, because all the uh, properties I will describe, the superfluid properties, are dynamical properties in the sense that uh, the velocity is not there if there is no phase gradient. So um, the this is because when we will think of tests for looking for superfluidity of our samples, we will always invoke dynamical experiment. So uh, I will describe why we get a superfluid uh, uh, condensate in the, in the next slide, but just a, a small summary of uh, what are the consequences of these uh, equations. Um, the, the hydrodynamic equations can describe very nicely the condensate expansion in the time of flight. Uh, in this case, you can even uh, neglect some of the terms. And this is extremely useful because all the pictures I show you, this picture, for example, is not taken with inside, with atom inside the trap. You have to ha have in mind, uh, especially if you are a theoretician, uh, that when I show you pictures, uh, most of the times it's done after a time of flight. And it relies on the fact that making a time of flight is a kind of microscopy because uh, the expansion is very often self-similar. And so you can zoom inside the gas after this time of flight expansion and get these very nice pictures uh, that you would not be able to observe directly in situ. Because uh, the, as we will see next, the size of these holes is a healing length. And typical numbers for the healing length is a 0.1 micrometer. So with these numbers, you cannot detect them optically. And 
whereas after an, a time of light expansion, it can be uh, five, ten micrometers. So you can, you can see them uh, without any problem. So. A lot. That is essentially uh, interactions which give the initial kick. So, okay. Alors, in this picture, it's not self-similar because it's a 3D gas with vortices. So here it's better than self-similar to see with vortices because if you start from a 3D cloud, with vortices and make the expansion. In fact, the vortex cores, they expand faster than the rest of the gas. So you see them in even better. In two dimensions, it is self-similar. If, if you continue to confine the atoms in the vertical direction for the expansion, then it's self-similar, and then it's harder to see the vortex sizes. Then um, they what happens when you switch off the, the trap, that essentially you have the interaction energy, which gives you the velocity field. And you can neglect completely the, the kinetic energy part. So the, the interaction energy transforms into uh, kinetic energy. So if you make the, you look at the energies you have before. You have the kinetic energy, which for uh, the case where we the Thomas Fermi regime, which is this case, which is most of the cases, is extremely small. So in general, you can neglect it. And then you have the interaction energy. And then you have the trapping energy. And after, what you do, you release the trap. So instantaneously, you remove this energy. So the energy you measure, in fact, is just the interaction energy you had inside the gas. And this interaction energy converts into kinetic energy that you can observe uh, after a time of flight. Yes, then in this case it's different. Yes, you have a lot of kinetic energy in this case. Yeah, or, or if you rotate very fast, as there is a yes, this is different. This is for equilibrium. This is a custom paper of uh, 96. It's based on gross PTFT equation, time dependent gross PTFT equation, except that you can uh, make a, an ANSAT um, which uh, describes the expansion as being self similar, which works very, very well. So you essentially have always the same DC with axes of size not Y, RZ, but lambda X, RX, Y, RY, lambda Z, RZ. And these lambdas, they obey a differential equation uh, depending on if you exact collective mode or if you um, make a, a time of flight expansion. And so all is described within gross PTFT formalism. Yes. Okay, so let me indeed go into the situation where uh, we add some perturbation to the gross PTFT uh, zero temperature solution. So in the first uh, series of slides, I will consider a flat box, so no trapping potential. And even in this uh, slide, it's more a, the, a periodic boundary condition situation, so really si close to what we've seen this morning. And uh, now if I look at the, the equation, and I wonder what is a small perturbation on top of the equilibrium solution. So the equ equilibrium solution is given by V being zero, uh, time derivative being zero, so zero is equal to zero. This is zero, this V is zero. So I'm left with a Gn plus Vx plus a kinetic energy 
is constant, and this constant is mu, and so it is a time-independent gross PKFK equation. Uh, and so this gives me, uh, if there is no external potential, the solution is just a uniform density, N0, in, uh, everywhere. So um, the trick is to, to look for a small perturbation on top of a N0 uniform density to uh, write the perturbation to this um, uniform density under the form of N0 plus delta N and linearize the hydrodynamic equations for delta N and V. So I only keep the linear terms, and uh, so it simplifies a, a bit. And now from this uh, equation, I look for a plane wave solutions, uh, and I look for the dispersion relation between omega and K. And what I find is that if I replace uh, delta n by uh, this, uh, that when I have a nabla term, it will give me uh, ik, and wha when I have a d over dt, it will give me a minus i omega. So here I have a minus omega, here I have a plus k, here I have a minus omega, and here I have a k squared, uh, and a minus k here, and this is uh, just uh, delta n, and what I have done in addition is to multiply this equation by n0 and multiply this one by m to be able to recognize here m n0 v, m n0 v, and eliminate m n0 v between these two equations. And if I do so, I have something where delta n appears on both sides, and what I get is a um, dispersion relation for the frequency as a function of the momentum. And here I use the fact that in the uh, non-excited solution, uh, the density is mu over g, so there is a relation between uh, mu and g and zero, so it's can either mu of g or g and zero. So the square of the frequency is a sum of a term in k to the fourth and a term in k squared. So this is called the Bogolubov spectrum. And uh, there are two nice limits that we can identify from this equation. So first, if I look for excitations of low momentum, long wavelength, uh, then uh, this term becomes negligible. And I find that the frequency is just given by uh, omega is equal to k times some velocity, t, and the velocity is square root of mu over m. So it's typically... Um, a dispersion relation of sound waves, and C is the speed of sound in my example, uh, which is also related to mu under this form. Mu is c squared, uh, nice equation. Now, if I take the other limit of large k, and then this term is dominant, I can even make an expansion where I take into account the correction from this one. And then I find that the energy associated to this excitation is an energy of free particles on top of the chemical potential, which describes the interaction of these free particles with the condensate, which represents, as I said, it's just a perturbation, so which represents a majority of atoms. Um, so um, we are in between uh, two regimes, and the limit, the separation between these two regimes, again, uh, is set by k being uh, equal to the inverse scattering length. So what is low k? What is k? So low k is k much smaller than one of a scattering length, and high k is k larger than the inverse scattering length, uh, which now I can also express in as a function of the speed of sound by using this relation. So psi is also h bar over mc. So here is uh, how the Bogolubov spectrum looks like. This is a black line here with this equation. And the asymptotic uh, dispersion is uh, for, for low k is this blue line, which, which is a sound. And for large k, it is a particle dispersion relation, which is this red line. And you see that the transition from one regime to the other one occurs at uh, psi uh, to the power minus one. So this has been uh, 
uh, in 2002 in the group of Nir Davinson uh, uh, in Israel. And the, the way it works, uh, I think David will describe it in more detail, is to use Bragg diffraction. So essentially you measure the um, S of K and omega, the uh, dynamic structure factor. You so you, you, get, uh, you give a kick to the sample at some value K and you look which is the energy you need to give for it to be resonant. And you nicely recover a linear uh, relation at small k's and then uh, parabolic, and this is uh, the fit from uh, the Bogolibov theory. So in fact, it's not done in a uh, uniform, very long system, but in an elongated gas. But the size of this gas is long enough for the effect of 1 over r, the size of the gas, to be very, very small. So you can still develop some waves along this long elongated uh, gas, uh, which means that you are able to see the linear dispersion be even if uh, it's a finite system in reality. Uh, so I want to, to give you a warning uh, at this point. Uh, it's linear at small k. if if there are interactions, because if you, I come back here, the linear coefficient, the, the speed of sound depends on mu, and mu vanishes for non-interacting gases. So uh, the fact that it is linear is really linked to the fact that it is a weakly interacting gas. Without interactions, no uh, linear part, only a quadratic dispersion, and the consequences are enormous, because the fact that we get this linear part in the spectrum um, it has some uh, for consequence that it is superfluid. So if I look at the Landau criterion for superfluidity, which is, am I able to uh, damp um, an object flowing into this uh, fluid uh, by creating excitations into the fluid? So let me consider an object of mass m, momentum p, which is uh, launched into the fluid at a speed p over m. And I wonder, as is the case in a real fluid, uh, in a normal fluid, will it be damped after and stop after some time by heating the fluid and creating excitations in the condenser? So I need to look for momentum and energy conservation, so it's an infinite system. Uh, before the, uh, the shock, in a sense, I have a total momentum p for object plus fluid, which is all in the object, and the energy is p squared over 2m because the energy of the condensate is zero. Now after the object has a modified momentum, and I have a momentum of an excited particle from the condensate, and the energy then is modified uh, because there is the energy of my object plus the energy of my excited particle. Now, if you use the fact that momentum is conserved, you can write p prime as p minus p star and inject this relation of p prime into the energy conservation. And by eliminating p squared over 2m, you find that uh, you have the, product, the scalar product of p times p star over m, which is nothing but velocity of the object scalar product with p star, equals to the energy of the excitation plus uh, the p squared over 2m of the excitation. O now, p squared over 2m is positive, so it means that this uh, scalar product has to be larger than e of p star, with e being my dispersion relation, this one, okay? And this uh, um, energy is always larger than its blue tangent here, it is always larger than this. So uh, I get the relation that the scalar product of the velocity of the object times the momentum of the excitation must be larger than the speed of sound times the momentum of the excitation. And from this, the most favorable case for that is having the object against the, well, in the same, uh, sorry, the excitation in the same direction of the, than the object, which is uh, logical. And so it means that excitation may be created only if the speed of this object is larger than the critical speed. 
and the three critical speed is the speed of sound. So again, warning here, the speed of sound vanishes for non-interacting gates. And this uh, has been observed in several experiments. I show you here the experiment done in the group of Jean Dalibar, in fact, in a 2D gas, where they measure the heat given to the gas as a function of the velocity of a laser which stirs the gas at some particular value of the density. And they nicely observe that with a velocity below some critical velocity, ex essentially nothing happens. And above this critical velocity, some heat is, is given uh, to the system, and which scales, uh, in fact, like quadratically with the uh, additional velocity with respect to the critical velocity. OK, so with this experiment, this is a direct signature of superfluidity of this sample. Okay, so there are two, I, I haven't said that this is the speed of sound. Um, so it's not, it, it's much less. And so the, um, the velocity, when it, because this uh, laser beam is uh, microscopic with respect to the healing length, this is a, the relevant size is the healing length, essentially. If you can have a point, a defect which is just point-like, then you would find uh, the speed of sound, but you cannot do this experiment. And so you find something which is much less, which takes into account the strength of your defect because there is a local depletion, so it's a more difficult pro problem, but still you find a threshold. And uh, the speed you expect has been predicted uh, in particular by Nikola Pavlov. Uh, I don't have the reference uh, talk, but it's uh, beginning of uh, year 2000 something. Uh, he computed this problem exactly such that you can compare with uh, predictions done with the gauge space. Okay, so now second criterion, second signature of superfluidity that will be a main topic of this, uh, of this school and conference, uh, quantized vortices. So this was not in the Bourdieu spectrum, just make me be clear. Uh, that's something which is in the GPE equation but uh, to find it, you with our assumption of small excitations and linearizing everything, we lost uh, these vortices. But you we can still recover them by uh, looking directly at the solution uh, of the time-dependent gauss pilevsky equation. And I told you that the rotational of the velocity is zero. Okay, this is true um, uh, while where there is a fluid, but the circulation of the velocity may be non-zero if you compute it around a region where there, I there is no particle, a sing singularity. So around such a point, uh, then you can have a situation where a the wave function uh, scales like e to the i l theta, which means that you have a one over r uh, velocity field, uh, which a is oriented tangentially to circles like that, which rotates around uh, some point and with a decrease like 1 over r when you go away from the center. And uh, r's psi must be uniquely defined when you make a, a loop. Uh, it means that this L is only allowed to take integer values. And now if you compute the circulation, you find that it is quantized in terms of h over m with the, the same uh, value L. So the fluid rotates with a quantized circulation. Uh, now what is the size of the hole? Okay, so to, to check if this, what is the size of the hole, we, we, we see that the velocity is larger and larger and larger, and what will occur at some point is that the velocity will reach the critical velocity, the speed of sound, and that's the place where the density will drop and uh, the superfluid density will, will drop to zero. And now if you write that the velocity h bar over m uh, r is equal to the speed of sound, you find that this occurs at a radius h bar over mc, which is nothing but the healing length again. So the size of the hole is the healing length for a circulation one. And uh, now um, you may wonder, okay, we can have L being two, three, four, uh, why not? 
Uh, in fact, if you stir the gas and uh, look at uh, vortices, you will see lots of vortices of charge one, but no vortex with charge two or three. That's because the kinetic energy uh, of one vortex, uh, as it is a kinetic energy, is case like V squared, so like L squared where L is the charge of the vortex. Uh, so it's more, uh, inf it's, uh, it, it costs less energies to have N vortices of charge one, because it's energy proportional to N, than to have one vortex of charge N, because now it's scales like N squared. So that's why um, multiple charge vortices are unstable, and what you observe instead uh, is a vortex lattice where vortices arrange uh, in Abrikozov lattice, which is a triangular lattice, because you can also model the, uh, um, the field by uh, uh, describing the uh, effective interaction between vortices, which uh, in 2D like is like a log or, or it's, it's a kind of Coulomb-like uh, repulsive interaction. So it arranges into a triangular lattice shape. Okay, so now, last uh, part. Uh, let me now consider a trapped both gases. And for today, we will consider a both gases in harmonic traps and dynamics. So now, uh, again, we start from the two hydrodynamic equations, and I replaced uh, the Vx term by one half of omega squared r squared. And at least for this slide, I will consider uh, isotropic, a spherical harmonic trap, so all the um, chopping frequencies are equal in all three dimensions. And we will play the same trick of saying, so first, uh, as uh, we are in a trap, it's uh, when the interactions are not completely negligible, the Thomas Fermi profile is very good approximation. And the quantum pressure is the one which is responsible uh, to the effect of the healing length of on the side of the inverted parabola. So it's very marginal for describing the, the dynamics here. So we will just neglect the quantum pressure. So up, I remove this term here. Now I will linearize uh, these two equations around the Thomas Fermi solution. So the Thomas Fermi solution is the inverted parabola with a peak density N0 and a radius, which is the Thomas Fermi radius with R. So it means if I linearize uh, that, okay, this one I removed already. This is order two, so I removed also. And now I replace uh, N by N0, one over one minus R squared over R, big R squared plus delta N. And the N0 blah, blah, blah is the one which will, with R being such that it will cancel all those three terms. So only the delta N will stay there. By definition of the Thomas Fermi radius, Thomas Fermi radius is the one which is such that this is zero. So if we uh, eliminate now V between the two equations, we have an equation with a second derivative with time of delta N which is uh, nothing but minus omega squared delta n if we look for uh, oscillations. And this is linked to uh, g n0 over m1 uh, minus uh, r squared over big r squared times gradient, gradient of delta n. So the gradient of delta n comes from the fact that I neglect everything inside here except delta n. And the g n0 comes from this n here. Inside here, as I have V, I have to take uh, the first, the zeros order for N0 because I already have something small here. So this N is just the zeros order, all that. And the V, I'm left with just G delta N, so it's there. So the G I put here, and here you see I have G N0 over M, which I can also say it's mu in the center of the trap over M. And mu over m, if you remember, it was the square of the uh, speed of sound. So I, I want to uh, write this uh, equation with the gradient of the local speed of sound. So the local speed of sound, which will be related to the local chemical potential with the local density. So in three dimensions, you can solve this equation by uh, using all the symmetries of the problem and using uh, 
Harm, um, Harmonix, uh, YLM. And, and then you find that a, the collective modes you get are uh, described by uh, three quantum numbers n, l, and m, with m going between minus l and plus l, but the energy only depends on n and l, and is given by this formula. So typically, if you take n equals to zero and l equals one, uh, you find the dropping frequency. But this mod with n equals to zero and l equals one is just the collective uh, center of mass motion, so you find it in all three directions. And now if you take n equals to 1 and l equals to 0, uh, you find square root of 5 omega 0. And l equals to 0 with n equals to 5 describe the breathing mode. So the breathing mode is at square root of 5 omega. And this has been observed. This has been uh, evidenced in the group of Cornell already in 96, I think. I will give more detail on, on two-dimensional gases in the following. So let me give you also what you find for a two-dimensional gas, it's almost the same formula, except instead of the three, we, we have two here, which means that the same breathing mode corresponding to n equals to one m and m equals to zero is now at two omega. Uh, so, and this is a very uh, celebrated Cité uh, Roche mode, which is undamped and which is a signature of the fact that there is a scaling symmetry in two dimensions. So this is a full spectrum uh, if I go beyond uh, the, uh, this low energy mode. And you can even identify some critical uh, velocity, which is the smaller, well, the larger slope, which is below all the energy, so the tangent here. And so if um, we try to understand what this critical velocity means, uh, it means uh, the velocity at which you can um, uh, drag a, or you can rotate the trap in a sense and it corresponds to the smaller uh, rotation rate where the first excitations appear and these excitations appear with a, a m number which is large so they this, this, this m describes the angular uh, symmetry so uh, if I look at the shape of this mode here I will see that it is a surface mode at the border of the cloud and when you rotate, you will let vortices enter. And so what it means is that when why vortices enter is that because you, you destabilize the size, uh, the size of the clouds at the border, and uh, you will let vortices enter with this kind of uh, off mode. So this is related to surface mode and has been uh, proposed by Englin uh, as an explanation of uh, how vortices will enter a, a gaze which is rotated. Now, if I concentrate on the lowest energy mode, I identified, as I told you, uh, the monopole mode with n equals 1 and m equals 0. And this monopole mode, as it is a compression mode, it is a good mode to study the equation of state because it will relate the chemical potential to the density. So it will give you how the um, reacts to compression. Now, there is this... Uh, dipole mode here, which is just a center of mass mode. So it give, gives you essentially the trap frequencies. And it can be used as a clock. If you are an experimentalist, you are happy to know what is your uh, unit of frequency. So you can observe that to clock the other modes. And this green dot here uh, corresponds to n equals to 0 and m plus minus 2. And this is a quadrupole mode. So it's a, I am in 2D, right? So it's a mode for which I have a deformation like that. So there are two. There, this one, the one which is 45 degrees off, but they have the same energy. And in fact, I can define them differently if I prefer, just like a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator where you can use x and y, but you can also use plus and minus by looking for a, a basis which is also diagonal in the w which uh, conserves angular momentum and if you you do so then the two m equals plus or minus two modes uh, instead of doing that they do this or that so it's a elliptic deformation which rotates in one direction or the other one 
And these modes are characteristic of a superfluid. So you will not find them in a classical gas unless you are in a collisional regime where there are lots of collisions, so it's the hydrodynamic regime of a classical gas, where uh, the, at the atoms will make many collisions during a harmonic oscillation. So if you are in this situation, then this mode exists for thermal, at, uh, thermal gas, but otherwise it's characteristic for a superfluid. And finally, the scissor mode. So uh, here it's a situation where it's not isotropic, but you have two different frequencies, x and y. And uh, this also is only for the superfluid. And this scissor mode is it's uh, linked. It's called like that from a, a nuclear physics. In fact, a mode inside the nucleus. But it's a mode where the condensate oscillates around a main axis of the trap. So you can um, uh, excite them by rotating suddenly the main trap of the axis. And it has been uh, used in the years 1999-2000 uh, to check the superfluidity of trapped uh, both gases in the group of uh, Chris Foote and the proposal was from uh, David Gary Odlin and Sandro Stringari. Uh, and what they did was exactly that. So they have an elongated trap. They change the main direction of the trap very fast. And then they observe if the cloud makes a, an oscillation of the angle or, in fact, an oscillation of the average of x, y distribution. And uh, if you have a thermal gas, then there is no proper mode like that. It doesn't exist this mode. So what you do when you change the axis, you will essentially excite x and y motions together and observe the beat node between uh, the x and y dipoles. And so you will observe an oscillation of the, of the xy uh, average at uh, frequencies omega x plus or minus omega y. You will see both of them. So this is the signal you observe. Whereas if the gas is superfluid, this is a proper and well-defined mode. So you observe a single frequency uh, for a very long time, not uh, very weakly damped, and with a damping which depends on the temperature, and they, they um, studied that uh, a bit later. So this is the first paper. Okay, so uh, for a summary, um, what I explained today, that BC occurs below a critical temperature or above a critical atom number. Uh, it can take place in a 3D box or in a harmonic trap in two and three dimensions. In fact, the 2D box is a, is a limit case uh, where you just can't have a BC. The, if you calculate the critical temperature, it is zero. Uh, the um, dynamics of the condensate now is captured in the mean field regime by the Gross-Petersky equation or the hydrodynamic equation. A weakly interacting BC is a superfluid, and you can probe superfluidity by dynamical experiments, for example, by looking for vortex lattices, uh, observing a critical velocity, and looking at specific collective modes. So I didn't mention that there is also experiments where you observe persistent uh, flows in uh, annular traps. This is another experiment that you can make to check that you have a, a superfluid. Next time, so on Wednesday, we will uh, change uh, a lot uh, the topic because I will describe uh, more experimental uh, stuff where I will explain how to be able to trap the atoms inside a, a kind of bubble where then uh, we will study the different collective modes. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> okay, a bit longer, but uh, not... Uh,